I would like to welcome you all here to this extraordinary Sofia Crypto Meetup event. This month has been very, very eventful actually. This is, we, we have had three extraordinary events and uh, next week we have our usual event which is, which is going to be dedicated to regulation and um, legal frameworks for ICOs. So you can check, check in the group when it's going to be, uh, it's going to be actually Beta House. So you can, um, you are all welcome to join us. And for tonight we have Giacomo Zucco from BHB, uh, who is, uh, of course, uh, I have mentioned this a couple of times, uh, big, big expert in, on Bitcoin, also a Bitcoin uh, maximalist, and he'll be talking about uh, Bitcoin governance and scalability. I give the word, word to him. Thank you very much, thank you. Okay. Big, not, not in the sense that I'm getting fatter, but in the sense that I'm very passionate about it. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm Giacomo Zucco, and uh, this is, these are my contacts. If you have to make to ask some questions that uh, you always wanted to ask about Bitcoin, but you never had the courage to ask, uh, you can write me on Twitter or via email. Uh, what I do is basically uh, consulting institutions about uh, Bitcoin. Uh, we run a business called BHB that has uh, two sides. One is, uh, well, maybe I should twist a little bit the projector. Well, anyway, you can guess part of the, of the image. Uh, so, no, just something missing in the, in the corner. Strange. Anyway, uh, what we do is basically we take money from uh, financial incumbents, so banks, uh, insurance companies, consultancy, and we use this money to develop free open source projects and library in the Bitcoin space, uh, basically financing uh, and funding all the major projects in the space, uh, all the major experts uh, worldwide. Uh, what uh, I would like to talk to you about tonight is something that we briefly discussed in, uh, in several meetups, but never in a systematic way. We get a lot of uh, questions about, uh, about this. Uh, a lot of you probably are, are wondering what is happening about uh, 2x uh, uh, hard fork uh, and uh, Bitcoin gold and block size debate and the governance on Bitcoin. Is it broken? Is it not? So I would like to, uh, to help you having a, an overview, uh, a very neutral and unbiased overview except that is not neutral and not unbiased, it's the, it's the absolute truth, and, um, and uh, open the, the time for some questions about this topic. Of course, you can also disagree with me. Uh, I will correct you, and, uh, and you, we can have a very peer-to-peer uh, -peer interaction. So, scalability and governance in Bitcoin. Let's start with uh, the scalability problem. Uh, basically, the first point is that uh, Bitcoin, as is right now, doesn't scale. Bitcoin is a set of four different technologies. These technologies are useful to answer different problems. The first problem, which is basically often uh, br uh, brand up like the, the essence of Bitcoin distributed ledger, is the fact that you have redundant uh, distributed copies of your financial ledger. Many people talking about b uh, blockchain, they talk about replication of data. Well, blockchain is not replication of data. That's just a little part of Bitcoin uh, technology stack. Every other, uh, I, ma how many of you are developers here? Okay, go, uh, a good amount. So you know that uh, a MongoDB with replicated flag is a distributed ledger. You know that Git, the, uh, the development, uh, open source development platform, is a replicated ledger, is a distributed ledger. You don't need a blockchain to have a replication of data. Where is the data? Is something that was already solved in the late 90s. Is something that is already solved in many multi-master multi uh, approaches. So that's not a 
very disruptive and very interesting part of Bitcoin. Uh, also, Bitcoin uses digital signatures like uh, like Bmoney, like eCash, like uh, like certified email. Digital signature is not something new, disruptive. It not, it's not blockchain. Digital signature is a legacy technology that we have since the 70s and the 80s. ECDSA is well consolidated and well known, and is not something revolutionary or disruption or disruptive. Uh, Distributed ledger technology scales pretty well. The fact that you can have different copies of your data around the world is a good, has, a, has good scalability properties. And digital signatures scale scales pretty well. You can have a, um, a private key and you can have a, uh, the, your counterparty checking your digital signature. Then you have the proof of work concept started with hash cash in the 90s, invented by Adam Beck, and then used it for the first time for financial purposes by, by Wei Dai in B Money in 1998. Satoshi Nakamoto took this stuff already existent and he, and he, uh, he used it for, uh, for Bitcoin. But the, and it's also very scalable. I mean, you can have one proof of work done somewhere. You can have this proof, use this proof of work as a commitment to deposit new assets on your financial ledger. Everybody in the world will be able to easily verify your work. And just some, uh, some of us will have the incumbency of, create, uh, of creating the new work. So this is scalable. What, what Satoshi Nakamoto introduced in, in uh, 2008 in the paper was the blockchain. So inside the proof of work, you don't just commit to your deposit of new funds, you also commit to a single, consistent, unique version of the history of the transaction up to that point. So this is a new idea. Use the proof of work to commit inside the proof of work one unique history, and this idea uh, sadly, w this, this is the blockchain, this is the, v the, the real new technology piece missing on all the other previous experiments, and this, this doesn't scale at all. Uh, of course, you can read in, uh, how many of you are not technical at all, not just not developers, but not really technical, uh, just traders or consultants or lawyers or... Okay, so you probably, re uh, there is three of you, you probably read, uh, maybe other other are just shy. Uh, you take a newspaper, you read that bit blockchain is fast. The banks will use blockchain in order to have faster transactions. And blockchain is cheap, because right now reconciliation is very expensive. But with blockchain, it will be cheaper. And blockchain is efficient. Uh, the reality of the technology is that the blockchain part of Bitcoin is actually very, very slow. Uh, it has to be very, very slow. It is very, very expensive, and by design, and it is very, very inefficient. If you read on some, uh, on some uh, newspaper that, yeah, blockchain, uh, uh, Bitcoin is not really interesting, but blockchain, the underlying technology, actually is the, the other way around. Bitcoin is an incredible invention. Uh, it's a game theory cryptographic invention that can change everything. But the blockchain, the underlying technology, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, it's necessary. Without the blockchain, you couldn't have a decentralized chronology of the transactions. So it was the missing piece that was necessary to create Bitcoin. But it's not really the best thing that you can have. Actually, it's what slows you down and makes everything very expensive and not scalable. Actually, we don't need blockchain without Bitcoin, as the people is, is writing on the newspaper. We actually do need and we are looking for uh, quotes, Bitcoin without blockchain. Uh, that means that we cannot avoid the blockchain entirely, but we should avoid the blockchain as much as possible because of its anti-scalability properties. That's just like using a court, a, 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 a law court. You don't want to go to a court and use a judge and a jury every time you want to contract a, a contract. Use that only if you have contro co some kind of controversy and you try to stay with private contracts as long as you can and as often as you can. You will sign private papers, private loans, private contracts, and only when you have to actually enforce these contracts, you will ask your counterparty to go 
to the to the notary to the to the to the, to the judge or to the trial uh, you, you will sue them in the worst case scenario in the best case scenario in order to avoid the enforcement which is expensive for both your counterparty will just comply with what is written in the contract because if, if it doesn't they know that they will they could eventually lose the the trial but they will also have to spend a lot so this is what we are this is the interesting thing is that the actual research on Bitcoin field is not mainly concentrated in the idea that you have to find a way to use blockchain without Bitcoin. That just makes no sense at all. Uh, yeah, you, you get a database uh, which is fun and very useful in many applications, but it's not something that you can market as new or disruptive or revolutionary. Yeah, a database, okay. Uh, use it, it can work, but not really interesting, uh, at, at least not uh, in this kind of application. So the problem of scale is actually uh, due to a trade-off. You can actually, <laughs> you cannot read the, second, the, the, the first part of the trade-off, but it, do, it goes like this. Imagine that you have, uh, I don't remember which number I put in the presentation, but let's imagine that you have a blockchain just like Bitcoin, where you have uh, two hours as an average for, for block confirmation. You have to wait for two hours. And uh, you have uh, one transaction per, uh, per block. Like uh, you have a block size of uh, uh, 500 kilobytes, and you can just fit your Coinbase transaction and one transaction. So you, you can confirm one transaction every two hours on average. In this, uh, th this blockchain has some cool properties. For example, you can validate it independently in a cell phone, in a modern smartphone. Uh, right now, I cannot validate my uh, blockchain payment, my Bitcoin payments in my cell phone. When I, when I try to do a Bitcoin payment, what I do is, when I receive a Bitcoin payment, what I do is asking to, uh, to a centralized, sometimes many of you, will ask to a centralized service, uh, am, uh, have I been paid or not? And the service will, uh, will answer, because you could be, you could, uh, you could be double spended if the, service, uh, the centralized service uh, uh, let you think so, or you could, just, you could just receive a payment on a chain that is invalid, which means that uh, miners could have, for example, uh, decided to, to, to mine a transaction when, when I steal Satoshi's Bitcoin, or to mine a transaction where you have, a, I don't know, any kind of different rules. When I, uh, I issue uh, 15 Bitcoins instead of 12.5 Bitcoin, so it's invalid, but I, w I can still mine it, and, uh, and other miners will not accept it because they don't want to lose money. But as long as you have a, 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 a smartphone, light node, you cannot independently verify that that's not the case. There is actually a thing called uh, SPV, simple payment verification, that is the reason that we have a Merkle tree of the transaction inside the, the Merkle root inside uh, the block header. So Satoshi did think about a way to independently verify a uh, transaction, but the thing is that this, this method helps but doesn't resolve the problem. Actually, you can be fooled when you receive a transaction, even with an SPV check. And, uh, and the thing is that SPV check also gives away a lot of privacy. When you want to check that you are, you are receiving a transaction, you will connect with uh, a central service or with random nodes, and you will give away, uh, using a few calls of a Bloom filter, you will give away practically all of your transactional privacy. Even when you spend Bitcoin, you, when you have to perform coin selection on your cell phone, you will often ask for a third-party service or a third-party node that you don't trust, and you will give away to them your private information. And it's very easy to, uh, I mean, of course, it's a random selected node, but it's very easy to civil attack this randomness, creating uh, 100,000 fake nodes that will just collect information of your Bloom filter calls. So if you don't have a full node, you cannot be sure that you, that, that you have been paid, not really. Uh, uh, you cannot be sure that uh, your payment will not just give up your uh, financial privacy. So the thing is that you still have to have all the blockchain. So get, getting back to my example, with this super 
slow, super expensive, and super inefficient blockchain of uh, two hours of confirmation and of one transaction per block, I can actually fit a, f a validating private full node in my cell phone. Cool. I also can use Tor every time if I am in China and I have to use a VPN plus Tor, which will be probably uh, complex to mine uh, and to broadcast uh, mined blocks right now. Uh, for example, you know that right now exchanges have been banned in China again, like the, for the fourth time, and probably they will ban it again in, uh, in one year when you, we have new all-time heights. So uh, every, every s now and then, China bans stuff in, chi in, uh, in China. Uh, if they do ban mining, uh, just go dark and hide the mining operation is not just difficult for because you need electricity, you need a huge, a huge place for your hashers, but it's also difficult because it's very tricky to try to broadcast and synchronize with the network behind the great firewall of China and maybe behind Tor and, and VPN uh, if you have a very huge amount of data to transact. While if you have this kind of super inefficient blockchain, you can easily validate, everybody can validate, everybody with an internet connection can validate the chain, but nobody can spend. Basically, the, if people start to use this blockchain, since everybody wants to be on the next block, and you have just one transaction validated every two hours, there will be a huge queue, a, a very huge uh, ocean in order to enter the first block, and so you will have to pay a lot of money to enter there. I don't know how much you can, there are some simulation made by smarter people, and you can check it out, but basically it will be super expensive to transact and super cheap to validate. Uh, let's go to the other extreme. In the other extreme, we say, oh, why, why do we have to wait 10 minutes? 10 minutes is too much. I want a blockchain that, valid, that, uh, that on average, accept a new block every 0 0.3 seconds, and I want two gigabytes of block size. I mean, why just one megabyte? In this kind of transaction, uh, the very cool thing is that uh, payment becomes very, very, very cheap. I get to a, a visa-like uh, kind of uh, true proof. I, I can accommodate a lot of transactions without eating any threshold, so there will not be a queue, there will not be a pressure on the market, and so fees will be very low, and also not just fees, but also confirmation time. I mean, if you are in a, in a supermarket, it sucks to wait uh, 10 minutes, but maybe 20, maybe 30, maybe 40, for n times in order to get to such certain number of transformation. That's that uh, confirmation. That's a very, very bad user experience. So in this part of the, of the trade-off, you have a, a wonderful situation where everybody can spend, but nobody can actually validate. This blockchain becomes huge after, after a few days, uh, and uh, you actually have uh, a giant problem of storage, but especially of uh, broadcasting and of validating time. You have, uh, uh, nobody will have a full node, basically, except few people, and these few people will have uh, access to your, sp your privacy, and very, very easy option to attack you with a civil attack uh, on the validation of the, of the rules of the blockchain. Uh, how many of you in this room maintain a Bitcoin full node? One? Two, three, four. So, uh, if uh, uh, so, and how many of you have sent in the last three months, or let's say six months, where the fee were even higher than now? How many of you in the last six months sent a Bitcoin transaction? Okay. So, if you accept my framing of the problem, and you're asking yourself if we are too much here, so. Uh, nodes are too much an hassle to maintain. You cannot maintain on your cell phone, not even on your, P on your PC. Uh, and here, yeah, everybody can validate, but nobody can spend. You may probably think that we are not really super balanced here, but we are a little more too much on the right side of the trade-off. Of course, this will not be a completely honest uh, comparison because Send, uh, there are a lot of third-party solutions, very easy to send bitcoins, and there are not super easy user-friendly uh, user ways to install and run a, a full node. So it's not super fair as a comparison. But if you just 
uh, accept a simplified version where uh, you have to choose between everybody validating or everybody, so people independent but very expensive transaction, or very cheap transaction but everybody depending on few uh, full nodes. So we may say that we the Satoshi was even too much, uh, too much. Uh, naive about uh, block size and block time. Of course, depending on this uh, improvised poll. Uh, if you have objection to the scientificity of the poll, you, you will raise the objection in, in, in few minutes. So there are possible solutions to this, uh, to this problem. Uh, there are the conservative kind of solutions. Uh, in the conservative kind, basically, you avoid to use the blockchain as much as you can. You keep a blockchain not maybe uh, more on the left than it is now, you keep it where it is now, uh, forget if it's maybe too much on the right, but you don't change it, you don't reduce the block size, you don't, you don't, you don't increase the block time, you just keep it the, the way it is, and you start to, uh, to make uh, space for transactions off the blockchain, off chains. There are several ways to do that, and we can discuss some of these ways. One is trusted third parties, uh, which is bad, like using Coinbase, you don't, uh, Coinbase v, uh, to Coinbase, you don't actually uh, spend a lot of fee and you don't have confirmation times because you are just trusting a third party to store your Bitcoin. But that's not probably, that could be okay for a in Bitcoin investor, but not for a Bitcoin user because Bitcoin user wants independence. That's the, the main value proposition. So you can use maybe semi-trusted hardware. I don't know how many of you know about uh, Open Dime. Uh, open, raise your hand, Open Dime. Not, not many. So Open Dime is an hardware which is semi-trusted. So you have to trust Open Dime uh, people, uh, but you can easily check, uh, you can easily verify the, the, the process that builds the hardware. It's like a very, very cheap uh, Bitcoin hardware wallet that you can actually pass around to pay. So I, I arrive to the, to the bar, I want uh, 10 beers, instead of giving them a fraction of Bitcoin uh, with my wallet, I will pass them an open dime containing the right, the right uh, or few open dimes, it depends on the, the cuts, and they will, be, they will very easily verify uh, without any blockchain transaction. Uh, it's semi-trusted, it's better than the first, but still not there. So there are trusted, trustless hubs for payment channel. Uh, this is a very old idea. Nobody took the bother to develop it a lot, but this is something that we could do already one year ago or two years ago. It's better now with SegWit. It was diff more difficult to do before, but nobody's working on this because everybody's already excited by the, sec by the, by the other option, which is like the network. But basically, you can have one centralized hub that opens Bitcoin payment channels, and when you pass through that hub, you actually are f you have free and instant transaction continuously. It is centralized, but it is trustless up to a certain level because uh, it cannot steal your funds. It can censor you, and that's bad, but not steal your fund. So it's better than the first two. And then there is Lightning Network, which is another idea in which you have the payment channel, but everybody or almost everybody is an independent hub, and you can chain the hubs. So if I have to pay the, the bar, I don't have to hope that me and the bar are connected to the same super bank trustless hub, but they will just pay to the channel to my friend that will pay to his uh, uh, employer, that will pay to his banks, that will pay to uh, his ca the cousin of the, of the CEO of the bank, that will pay to the bar. So this is, uh, m many of you of course know about Lightning Network, we will discuss it a little bit. Then you have uh, the alternative designs, oops, uh, the alternative designs are the idea that uh, since you don't want to stress this trade-off uh, too much, then you try to get rid of the actual design of Bitcoin and you change it. Like uh, you create something like uh, the old idea of three chains where proof of work doesn't convalidate all the history, but all, only the history of some branches, and then you have to merge the branches somehow. Then you have the more extreme idea, like in uh, IOTA, of uh, DAG or Tangle, uh, the direct uh, acyclic graph of transaction, briding, uh, Tangle. So you don't have a blockchain, you just have transaction connected with each other without any kind of block size. Uh, this is fascinating, probably broken design, but could be, I mean, it's, it's interesting and not yet uh, proven wrong. Uh, of course, the actual implementation are not really 
uh, for, uh, let's say, trustable. Then you have uh, completed the different designs like Mimblewimble without a script, with better say commitments and without a, with, with a lot of cryptographical magic that I cannot explain. So uh, you can actually uh, adopt a conservative solution or you can try to uh, challenge the trade-off. Challenge the trade-off means uh, I don't care, so let's move to the right even if there will be some, somebody validating uh, I, for everyone, I really I don't think that will be a big problem. Or I do think that the, the, this will be a big problem, but I want to solve it in the original Satoshi's idea to have every light wallet with a real working SPV. So if you can crack a real SPV, then suddenly that maintains your privacy and it provides you security, then suddenly you don't need any more and uh, everybody is a full node approach. You can go back to few full nodes that cannot censor, cannot track, cannot uh, fraud, uh, defraud other people. But we don't have a working SPV right now. There is a concept called full uh, um, fraud proofs that could be implemented maybe with SegWit, but it's still not very clear. So the, the, in this hypothesis, everybody is happy. We can move to the right because uh, it doesn't really matter because we can validate everything uh, on our own. Uh, so uh, here I make the art, the, okay, prep is basically useless, but I make the, uh, I make the argument that uh, the argument, the, the, the push for a, a sense of uh, urgency about this problem is uh, basically uh, a false problem. So uh, you will have probably exposed, you, you will have been exposed to this argument that if you don't scale Bitcoin now, the altcoins will just take over. So rush, we have to scale Bitcoin, we have to have accommodate millions of transactions because otherwise altcoins will take over. My answer to this, uh, to this objection will be that actually uh, I don't care because uh, logically speaking, we have two, two paths here. Either this sentence that the, the alt, altcoins can take over is true, or it is false. If the sentence is true, then welcome. Uh, if uh, other chains can satisfy the same value proposition of Bitcoin in the same way in the long run, then actually I don't care if Bitcoin fails. We can keep Bitcoin confined to the, to the left, of the of the of the trade-off, because even if it gets surpassed by other superior altcoins with uh, one second of uh, block time and two terabytes of uh, block size, uh, it's better that way. Just natural selection. Uh, okay, we'll have some some financial loss because uh, I I just uh, invested in Bitcoin and not in shit coins, in altcoins. Sorry, uh, but uh, I can still. Uh, dump my bitcoins eventually when I when I actually realize my big mistake. So I will do that. I will lose some money, but we will live in a world with several different solutions to the bitcoin problem. That's good. That's great. So we don't need to force bitcoin uh, if other altcoins can take over. Just stay on the altcoin that you like. But if it's false, as uh, as I think. Bitcoin is an experiment which is almost impossible to replicate in the next decades and maybe in the next century because uh, I have several uh, arguments here. Like uh, Bitcoin was very little when it was created, so it was too little to be compromised by the big actor. And when it went big enough to be noticed, it was too big maybe to be disrupted. So I don't think that this kind of condition where Satoshi can just work in the open uh, without people trying to de-anonymize him, without people trying to corrupt or, uh, or, to, or to blackmail or to kidnap the other developers for, for three to five years. And just now you have the first external interfer interferences where the system is already very robust. I don't think this kind of experiment can succeed uh, again. Also, the coordination problem of having everybody, all the smart guys working on one project and the huge network effect where all the intelligence people can just, I mean, if you are a good uh, operative system developer, you go to work on Linux unless you have super strong reasons not to work on Linux. So if you are a very good blockchain expert, you go to work on Bitcoin unless you have super good reasons uh, not to work there. 
and I want more money with my SEO is not a technical super good reason. It's a human reason, it's, uh, it's completely understandable, but it's not the best way to select the best engineers. Also, you have all the ashing power, you, uh, you have a damn satellite beaming the blocks down there. So uh, probably Bitcoin is impossible to replace. If I'm right and uh, the other hypothesis is wrong, then I don't care about altcoins because they will not be able to provide the same value proposition in the long run. So we have all the time in the world to actually evolve this kind of uh, scenario. So that's my take on the question. So I uh, go faster because I'm, I'm going too slow, but the problem of governance. Uh, right now, uh, we have to face the problem of how to change Bitcoin. And that's a general problem that is like uh, the problem of deciding who is deciding the rules for everybody else. Uh, in the normal, in other contexts uh, except Bitcoin, we try different approaches. The first approach is, uh, that uh, we can analyze is democracy. So people will vote and they will vote uh, over the rules and the majority will win and will force the minority to follow the rules. This approach is not working super well, in my opinion, in social sciences and it's probably not working at all in uh, uh, cryptographic protocols. Why? For two reasons. First, you cannot have one head, one vote, because it's pseudonymous, so you have civil attack. That's why the blockchain was invented in the first place. And also, uh, it doesn't work even if you have that kind of, of check, because it simply doesn't. People, uh, uh, the people is smart when, when, they, when they have skin in the game in the decision. So people are smart in managing their own choices, their own trade-offs, their, their own externalities. When people start to vote on other people's externality and other people's choices and other people's trade-offs, they, they are not very smart and they're usually very easy to manipulate and they can get selfish and they can just try to externalize every cost and to free ride everything. So you have plutocracy, like who has more money will decide to everyone else. This is kind of better, actually, because uh, people invested in the system will have uh, more incentives to not fuck too much with the system. But uh, this also can create very, very strong uh, uh, situation in which uh, people with a lot of money can uh, be an external attacker that just want to use the money to shut down the system because they are competitor. For example, a very, very big central bank uh, okay, they will lose money in attacking the system, but they will make more money in manipulating the, 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 the monetary base of the world in the next century. So maybe they do that. Uh, so no, you cannot use plutocracy because uh, money is very easy to can easily come from the outside to manipulate to manipulate the choices. So you uh, you can have techno technocracy. So very smart people, only the very smart people can decide for everybody else. The problem here is that uh, smart people is a circular definition. Who is the smart people that can decide? I mean, I, I think I have an idea about the best people in Bitcoin, but maybe I'm wrong and I am validated by them and they are validated by me and it's circular. And so probably it's not very easy to, to, to solve this. So another option could be nobody. Uh, once we start, nobody can actually or easily change the protocol at all. This is actually the solution that Bitcoin is uh, going to, uh, to, to use in the most cases. And this solution is, uh, is interesting because, uh, in theory, it works. Uh, everybody decides for himself, but nobody can actually force the others to follow this decision. So nobody can implement, no min minority or no majority can implement a global change. Everybody can just implement a local change if they want to opt out, so they're free, but they cannot change the global dynamics. This is very good in theory, but you have two assumptions. The first, uh, so the idea is status quo always wins. This is a good governance model, and people that think that this go governance model doesn't work uh, are left with uh, the question, so what other kind of government models do we want to use? Like Decreed uh, is using this. Uh, uh, Ethereum is using a strange version of this, so it's like uh, v uh, it's like Vitalikracy. Uh, uh, he decides, and we follow. Uh, this uh, this status quo wins idea is the idea of Bitcoin. We have, we remains with two problems. First, 
we assume that the initial design that we will not change or not change very much or not change often was so good that it, not, not perfect, nothing is perfect, but it will be so good in order to last and to survive and to resist attacks for decades. Uh, for example, with the internet, uh, IPv4, the, the actual internet protocol we're using, were, was not perfect. Actually, IPv6 is better, but we cannot replace IPv4 because in that network, the status quo always wins and we, st we are stick with IPv4. F luckily, it was good enough to provide as internet for a few decades and everything that we are enjoying over the internet. So, I mean, good. IPv4 is not perfect, but it's just impossible to change for a long while. The same could apply with Bitcoin in theory. But are the, uh, the actual, is the actual state of the protocol good enough to be not changed or not changed seriously for a while? After SegWit, maybe. Before SegWit, unlikely. And still, maybe we miss something else to be very, very forward proof. And then you have another problem. How do you upgrade? Uh, because sooner or later, you will have to upgrade something. So the other thing I, and then I, 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 I promise that I will stop. The other thing that I want to stress out is the concept of, uh, consen uh, of consensus. A lot of people s speak about this uh, consensus in the Bitcoin space, but consensus is not what people thinks it is in it doesn't mean what people thinks uh, it does mean consensus is not actually uh, a solution to the governance problem consensus is only the solution the nakamoto consensus is only the solution to the double spending problem so the risk of a of a governance problem are potentially infinite, are the one that we analyzed in the previous slide. So we have infinite risk of changing the protocol. The risk of the double spending problem are very limited to the specific function. And you, uh, the choice of Satoshi Nakamoto was basically to use one version of plutocracy, which is uh, uh, money to buy uh, enough uh, ASICs from uh, an ASIC producer in order to choose the valid chain with most cumul cumulated work. It was not the idea of using plutocracy in order to, to select every, uh, every rule of the system for everybody else. So there is a, a, a common misinterpretation about uh, what uh, censorship means. Uh, if the miners have the majority of the hash in power, they can perform an attack. But this attack is not uh, inflating the money, stealing uh, your money, uh, doing whatever. The attack is just double spending their, co their own coins or censoring your transaction for a while, just for, a while, for, a, for long enough, as long as the attack is going over. So there are nasty things to, to very, very nasty things, but very limited double spending and for just, just while you have the control or censoring just when you have the majority. And it's not even certain because the process is statistic. So even if you have 51, you, you could not sustain the attack long enough to censor the transaction. So the idea is that, uh, well, your node, your node doesn't, your Bitcoin node doesn't follow the majority of the hash in power. It does follow the longest valid chain. So when Satoshi Nakamoto first built Bitcoin, he was following the longest chain. Following the longest chain uh, is very easy to attack because I can create a chain which is super long. I just uh, violate the validity of the difficulty adjustment, and then I win because I have the longest chain. But now, after the correction of Satoshi in the early years, uh, uh, the Bitcoin nodes follow the longest valid chain, so with the right valid rules. And so rules are not circularly defined by the, uh, the, vali the, the majority of the hash in power. When you have a Bitcoin node, you will follow the longest valid chain. If you want to change the validity, you have to change the code of your Bitcoin node. So you're not blindly following hash rate. Uh, so very, very uh, uh, another clarification about forks. Soft forks are forks. Now, forks is used uh, uh, in a very ambiguous way as a term. People say it's forks to, uh, to mean that the money is splitting in two different chains, but that's technically a split. A fork can be a successfully hard fork, like in Monero, every six months they hard fork and they remain with one Monero. In, uh, in Ethereum, they just hard fork to, 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 for Byzantium and they just have 
to Ethereum like before. Uh, so it's not that a fork is a split. A fork is a fork. A successful fork doesn't create a split. Uh, an unsuccessful fork creates a split. A soft fork is a fork where you actually con you keep all the rules and you just add new rules. With this kind of fork, you get a split only if you don't have at least a ma strict majority of the hashing power following. So if you have more than 51%, you don't split the money. Also, you cannot change every kind of rule. You, just, you, you, you can just add new rules, but your change cannot be unlimited. There are certain things that you cannot do. With an R fork, uh, actually, even if just 1% of the hash rate or 0.5% doesn't follow the, uh, the, doesn't upgrade, you will have a split. Maybe the split will die if the, if the chain is very, very slow. Maybe not. Maybe they will just wait for an adjustment. Maybe some trader will keep it alive. So to, to do an R fork right, you have to have complete uh, agreement by everybody. Very easy if you have a very small project uh, or a very centralized project like Monero is very small, or Ethereum is very centralized. But if you don't have a very centralized or very small project, it's basically impossible to successfully R4. You can do that, but you must do that for very, very trivial, small, super non-contentious changes. Also, every node of the system, every wallet, every exchange will have to upgrade to follow an R4 without splitting the network. So, Great scaling. I will not go through the slide because I'm, 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 I, I was too long. But basically, there is a story that you know uh, going until uh, the Bitcoin Cash uh, hard unsuccessfully. Uh, but I mean, uh, the Bitcoin Cash split in uh, first August, and what is happening now is basically Bitcoin Gold. So what is Bitcoin Gold? If somebody of you is interested, I will go more in details. But basically, uh, some Chinese guy, they will launch some kind of uh, scam coin with pre-mined uh, uh, pre coins. But then somebody thought, what if we just copy Bitcoin in a responsible way without changing anything, just 0 0.15 as is. We just put uh, strong reply protection, strong reply attack protection. We change the address format, so very responsible. And we change the proof of work in order to be ASICs resistant. So this is like Bitcoin, but you can mine it with a GPU. Very cool. Uh, they promised all these things. They didn't realize anything. I think the code is still missing. Uh, they will fork on 25 of uh, October, so the chain will split on 25 of October, but they will not launch the chain until they will finish the code. So the, the, the snapshot of the chain will be 25 of October, but probably the chain will be alive later in November, if ever, because they are very slow, apparently. Uh, Bitcoin 2x is basically a uh, few CEOs in the Marriott, I was in the Marriott Hotel, also other people here was in the Marriott Hotel, uh, they gathered in a room in order to decide how to, uh, how to govern Bitcoin better, and they decided that there was agreement among themselves uh, to do an R fork. Of course, uh, the, the future market shows that uh, almost uh, more than 80% of the market doesn't follow this, uh, this, uh, this intention, uh, but uh, a great part of the hashing power actually does, even because the hashing power is basically provided by one guy. Uh, and uh, also a big part of the payment processors uh, and payment payment intermediaries, they do agree, while um, um, almost any exchange and wallet doesn't agree. Uh, so this will, of course, being an hard fork, uh, 2x will be unsuccessful, because you cannot have a successful hard fork if you have some part of the network that doesn't agree. And uh, it will create a split if they don't stop it. And at this point, I, I was convinced that they will have stopped it when it was clearly going to fail to take over Bitcoin, but probably they will not. Uh, what is easy to predict is that if, you, if somebody of you is here since a lot, they, you know that if, if, with Namecoin and Litecoin, the altcoin concept was very huge. Like, we have Bitcoin and now we have another one. So there was a lot of importance in the first altcoins. Now we have Bitcoin and the altcoins. Uh, something similar can happen with the four coins, actually, because right now, I mean, why not? Uh, before we had Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash. After November, we will already have three uh, four coins, so probably this could be a new cool way to launch an altcoin. 
why not? Uh, and also Lightning Network will get into production. Lightning Network is already up and running in testnet, and there have been some Lightning Network transactions. Of course, you need uh, graphic interfaces for the users, and you need some liquidity in the channels, and developers of Bitcoin are super, super cautious. They, they ask everybody, please don't do anything in production until we are super ready. So uh, I, I think we will have to wait other few months to see uh, production ready wallets probably the first will be neutrino and then uh, and then zap and then uh, uh, maybe green address and then maybe other wallets like electrum will be uh, ready in 2018 somewhere uh, future of this conversation could be drive chains if you are interested we can discuss it hardware scaling like t chain or liquid ossification of the protocol at the hardware level and uh, maybe the end of the altcoin bubble. I will not discuss this, this slide. So, sorry if I was a little bit long. Open for your questions for one minute. No, joking. Uh, for as long as you want. You decide how much. Thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. If you can go back to the web, uh, to the slide with the um, trade-off between the two extremes. There it is. My question is, where do you think is the sweet spot right now uh, in this trade-off? And um, the second question is, does it change one year from now with the advancement of technology? I mean, bandwidth and the cost of storage. So I think that we are, uh, of course, the, the test I, I performed before was not a completely a fair test. But I do think that we are more in, uh, uh, right now, more in this direction than in this direction. I will say you, we are probably here. Uh, it, it, to be completely balanced, we should be more on the left. Actually, I think that to have uh, less people able to spend Bitcoin because eh, Bitcoin is too expensive and too slow, and having more people validating Bitcoin with their own node at home or in the cell phone, maybe in the cell phone is too much, but at least at home, would be actually better for the long, ru long run uh, value proposition of Bitcoin, which is not fast and cheap uh, payment, you have PayPal for that, but is permissionless payment, the kind of payment that you cannot do with a centralized party, because if you can do with a centralized party, uh, I mean, maybe, uh, let's use the example of the internet. Right now, everybody uses the internet. So even if, we, if you are messaging each other with WhatsApp or, or uh, Telegram, and you're writing, oh, this meetup is boring to the other person, and uh, you are using the internet, so you're using your 4G, telephone operator to go to a switch to a router in China to get back to the Wi-Fi of the place to get back to the other phone. This is a stupid use of the internet. I mean this is an inefficient use of the internet. But internet is there, everybody's on the internet, so you leverage it because it's just a standard. Someday I think that Bitcoin will be something like this. So people will use Bitcoin even for payments that do not need Bitcoin just because it's a standard. So you free ride. You go over the standard. But right now if you go back in nineteen ninety two and uh, you want to pass messages in a room, and you, so you buy two modems of uh, 4K dollars for, to install two modems, and you configure them because you want to, to write each other, this, this meetup is boring. That's a stupid use of a, uh, of a super huge global package switching network. So I think that right now, it's not really important that, b that b blockchain payment are, are uh, uh, cheap and fast. What is important is that they can be really censorship resistant and really, really impossible to track, censor, uh, track and censor, basically. And that you cannot change the monetary supply. So the reason to create Bitcoin was independence from central banks. We will not be inflated. And independence from government control, we will not be censored. We can pay WikiLeaks. If you give up that to have fast and quick confirmation, uh, a centralized technology right now will be better for that, eventually. So, long story short, I think we are too much uh, on the right, and we should go back on the left. 
I don't think that given the actual debate with people that want to go more on the right, it's very it's politically feasible to, to push for a short fork to have slower blocks and smaller blocks, which I, would th I think it would be better. So I will, I will just fight to stay here. Uh, and uh, it will it change in the future? Yes, it will. Because uh, in the future, this, uh, I mean, adoption will go high, so fees will be worse, while validation time and storage and, uh, and uh, bandwidth will be better. So if more laws, more law continue, and if the storage goes up, and if a broad, uh, the, broad, the band goes up and the validation time goes down, then probably uh, we could easily move in this direction without losing anything here. So having a, a dynamic block size would be better than having a fixed block size. Even having a dynamic block time would be better. Why do we have to wait 10 minutes when maybe we are in 2050 and in 2050, the, the, the propagation is so that we could just have two minutes with the same orphan rate as now. So the problem of, of block time is orphan rate, just as the problem of block size. So why do we have to wait 10 minutes? Right now, it's, it's me, maybe it's too few. Uh, we, we shouldn't wait more. But maybe in 2050, it will not be relevant. So having dynamic uh, factors will be better. The problem is, how the hell do you program? Uh, first problem, how do you change Bitcoin? once is out there. Hard forks have all the problems of hard forks. But even if you don't use hard forks, and maybe you can do that with a strange soft fork trick, how do you program that? Because you just assume that everything will go up. So if something happens like a nuclear war, or a non-nuclear war, or just some, something happens and the low more stops for 10 years, or something like that, this is, I mean, if you look at the history of man, Technology didn't always grow in exponential rate. It can plateau, or it can even have a strong correction for some geopolitical events. Do we want uh, to just program that to grow indefinitely? Uh, probably not. Uh, so do we want to measure? Like the, It's the, tricky. There are several proposals to do dynamic blocks. Pro, there, there is a good study about dynamic blocks, and probably, eventually, there will be a proposal by the Bitcoin developers about dynamic block size and time. But it's very difficult to implement. And I think it will need several years of study, several years of simulation, several years of testing and, uh, and uh, discussion, testing, and then a very slow deployment. And then we could have, uh, we didn't do that for uh, TCP IP. With internet, we are just stuck with IPv4 with the number of IP address that we have. Other questions? There. What are the advantages of Bitcoin Cash over Bitcoin? Uh, right now, one. Uh, right now, the fees are comparable. Uh, the block time wait, uh, the, the the wait that you have is very very long and unpredictable. You have one strong advantage: you can buy ASICs from Bitmine with that because they will not accept Bitcoin, only Bitcoin Cash. So if you buy Bitcoin, you can buy the ASICs, and that's one of the reasons of the pump today. Also, it has a smaller market cap. So if you are a trader with a lot of money. Your advantage is that you can manipulate it very easily. You can pump the price and crush the price, and that's very funny for traders. Uh, if you are just a user of a censorship-resistant uh, money, uh, your advantage is, I don't know. Uh, yeah, oh, uh, yeah, yeah that, that's right. You can, you can dump it and buy Bitcoin. That's a huge advantage. Hello, I have a question related to the last slide that you said you want to discuss. Well, no, I remember what the slide said. It said, when is the altcoins bubble going to burst? Which s says you assume that altcoins are, are, are a bubble. And I will make the argument that Bitcoin is the bubble, but the altcoins is the where the real value comes. Because we have a lot of altcoins like Eternity, Neo, Ethereum, and they have like whole economies behind them. They have real technology. Bitcoin, on the other hand, is a very speculative market. And that's why we have Bitcoin price rise, because everybody wants the fork and everybody wants Bitcoin gold. 
The same thing happened with uh, Bitcoin Cash, and uh, th there's no real reason for Bitcoin's price to rise so quickly right now, except the reason that people are going to get bought coins, right? So it's very speculative. It's not really, uh, it's not really as valuable as Eternity or Neo or Ethereum or, yeah. That's my question. Why do you say that altcoins are a bubble rather than Bitcoin? Okay, so. Clearly, we disagree. So we have two different uh, opinions, and uh, and mine is right. Uh, no, I'm joking. I, we, we don't know. Uh, so uh, so disclaimer: I will just exclude the presence uh, by any debate. So eternity is good, but for every other altcoins, my talk applies. Just just accept eternity. So uh, the problem with uh, uh, with altcoins is basically the problem, the same problem you had with all the alternatives to the internet protocols in the, in the early 90s. You remember, uh, you can read uh, about the protocol wars. It was not just TCPAP. It was TCPAP and many, many, many other uh, alternatives. It was mainly a fight between among engineers because you didn't make a lot of money creating a new alternative to TCPAP. So, you, you really had to be passionate to try to fight TCPAP. While if you create an altcoin, uh, you probably have some economic incentive. And that could maybe uh, change your, your incentives a little bit. Uh, not if you, actually, not, not directly if you create a fork coin. If you create a fork coin of Bitcoin, you don't have a lot of free money in the beginning. So that could be more similar to the, 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 the protocol wars. So the problem with the protocol wars was that many of the uh, Let's start this way. Even when you have a, a, a superior solution, the superior solution doesn't uh, outgrow the established solution. When you have strong network effects, uh, you don't uh, fight the, uh, you, you cannot win over the incumbent, even with a very smart outsider. Uh, this is very different from products because this is a base protocol. So uh, I, always, I often do this example. Uh, do you know Candy Crash game on Facebook, right? You have annoying uh, notification. How difficult I is it to change Candy Crash for a new, better game on Facebook? Very, very easy. That's, I mean, the, uh, uh, actually, Candy Crash will die and something better will arrive. That's uh, almost certain. How is it uh, to change Facebook uh, on, or, uh, under the, the, the Facebook apps. That's more tricky because you have a strong network effect, but not impossible. We had MySpace, and now we have Facebook. To, to challenge Facebook is very difficult, but in uh, East Europe, we, uh, we contacted did a very good job clonating Facebook. It's even, it's even better technologically. And, and so uh, it's not impossible to replace Facebook. Facebook is based over World Wide Web. How difficult it is to replace World Wide Web? There was experiment, Web 2, and, but now you have the API of many services based on the web. You have cell phone using the web API. So the web is basically a standard, very, very difficult to change. Maybe Maybe we will change it. But then, how can you change HTTP? I mean, yeah, we managed to do HTTPS because it was strictly necessary, but whoa, change HTTPS means basically changing everything, the other protocols. Uh, how do you change TCP IP? Not just with TCP IP version 6, but when, you, when people started to broadcast, uh, to do Skype and voice over IP, IP was terrible for streaming. UDP was better. But the problem is that I, TCP was there with strong network effects. So my guess is that Bitcoin is not a product. You, cannot, uh, you not, don't sell Bitcoin, you don't market Bitcoin. It has some product characteristic like a cool logo, not so cool, but a logo uh, so that internet didn't have. So it's more product-like than internet, but it's probably at the level below World Wide Web, and I think below HTTP and closer to SMPT and to uh, HTT, uh, TCP IP. Um, so, so if that's the case, then even better solution will not take over. And bit, uh, internet network effect was just one, the network effect. You had all, uh, all the people connected to internet. Network effect is the difference between a phone, a cell phone, and a banana. They can have a similar shape, but with a banana you can just be alone on a desert island, you open it and you eat it. You, when you're alone in the desert island with a cell phone, you cannot do anything with it because its value depends on how many other people is using the same, exactly the same protocol. So, uh, 
internet was a, a, a protocol, Bitcoin is a protocol. Also, Bitcoin has another network effect, which is mining hash rate. Very, hash rate is a, a negative sum game, is what the socialist economists will, will call a natural monopoly. But that doesn't mean that you need the state intervention, but this is another discussion. Uh, it's su sub-additive. Uh, it is a, zero, a negative sum game. So it's better, uh, let's say, that one giant network with one proof of work is exponentially more secure than two separate networks with two divided proof of work. So you, if you have a 50 uh, tera hash and 50 tera hash, the security is x. If you just join with 100 tera hash, the security is not 2x. The security is uh, uh, e. Uh, e uh, square uh, power x. So, not really, but kind of. Uh, so the idea is that you have a strong hash rate uh, network effect. Also, you have a monetary network effect that the internet didn't have. So uh, it's more, uh, if the value of one money used by more people is more than the sum of the values of money used by by few people. When you join a network, you get more value. So you have network value, hashing power value and monetary value. Plus you have the brain value, the, the mind share value. Uh, as I said before, if you are a good engineer and you, you like to work on an open source operative system, yeah, you can invent your own, but basically you will use, you will join Unix, Linux, uh, you will join Linux efforts. That, that's, that's what you do because you don't want to reinvent the wheel. So if you are smart enough, you join Bitcoin. And if you can't, you create your pet project because you can't. Uh, so that creates a network effect of brains and uh, that let me think that not only if there was a better alternative to Bitcoin, it will not succeed in, in the next decade, so probably century or something like that. But even that, right now there are not better solution to Bitcoin. So if you have a specific uh, alternative that we want to discuss, which is not eternity, I will enter into specifics about the superiority. I think that right now Bitcoin is strictly superior of diff different orders of magnitude than any other uh, altcoin out there. Uh, there are some interesting stuff in Monero. Uh, Litecoin had Segwit first, okay. Uh, there are uh, Uncle reward in Ethereum is interesting, probably broken, but interesting. And that said, I don't think we have anything interesting outside the Bitcoin space, but that's just my opinion. Uh, hi. Uh, first of all, I would like to ask what are the best independent and uh, trustful sources uh, regarding the Bitcoin scaling debate that we can use to educate ourselves. And then uh, who are the most influential people in the community right now that you can follow and get the, and they, ha and they have no incentives, expect getting Bitcoin better. Uh, so difficult questions. Uh, because uh, as you have seen, I try to, to represent the debate in a kind of uh, honest way, uh, also trying to, uh, to understand all the, uh, all the different kind of, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, incentives, but I, I am stro strongly biased through one position in the b debate right now. And so I, of course, think that everything is written on uh, Bitcoin.org, for example, which is the pro-core, anti-2x, uh, uh, maximum kind of uh, level. I think that's correct. Uh, the the Bitcoin.org uh, uh, the Bitcoin.org alert against the 2x company that will try to hijack the SPV nodes. I think that's factually and technically correct. So I would say that Bitcoin.org is a, a uh, is the right source of information, but it's not really unbiased and equilibrated because they have a strong position. They follow it, and also that's part of this war started also because of all the censorship problem. So the problem that uh, you, uh, that basically pu uh, some guys, uh, they did own Bitcoin.org and the red subreddit r uh, slash Bitcoin and, and Bitcoin Talk. And they promoted this community, so they control this community, which is there. Uh, you are free to fork it, but not free to change it. And so they decided to use a very strict approach, like every 
four coin, every altcoin cannot be discuss, discussed in the main stuff, and every four coin is an altcoin by definition, which is correct technically, but it, it, it created a lot of frustration. And so, if you go to uh, basically, uh, so let's start from the very top. If you connect to IRC and you go to Bitcoin Core Developer uh, and Bitcoin Wizard, you find a lot of very, very cool information. If you go on, if you read the Bitcoin developer mailing list, that's very, very precious information. If you read Bitcoin.org, you have good information, very, very strong, strongly biased on one side, but which I actually do think is the correct side. And if you go on, uh, well, Reddit is just for news, but I mean, in Reddit there is just everything, so don't go there. But uh, if you go on, uh, uh, well, Bitcoin Stack Exchange is a very, very good place for technical information. Very good people work in there, Bitcoin Stack Exchange. Uh, then you can do, uh, so w w uh, people to follow. There is a few journalists that I think they are very, very good in what they do. One is Aaron von Virdum. That is the pronunciation correct? Yeah, probably. Aaron von Virdum. Uh, he works for Bitcoin Magazine. Bitcoin Magazine itself is not a super good source of information right now. It was. Right now it's full of... I will not believe anything I read, I read on uh, Cointelegraph or Coindesk. There are just, I mean, people pay for advertisement and you just have every kind of stuff there. Uh, not not technical sound, uh, technically sound. So Bitcoin Magazine, Aaron is very good. Kali Torp is very good. Uh, Tour de Mester, uh, more, more trading than technical, but he is very, very, very good. Uh, there are some biased and some, sometimes strongly biased, but I think good source of information in some uh, YouTube channels like uh, um, the, uh, the crypto network, crypto world news network. Uh, you know, Tone Vice. And uh, Tone uh, is very good, in my opinion. He, he managed. He did a show called the Crypto Scams, where Dixon. Uh, yeah, 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 uh, yeah. And uh, Vortex, the Vortex show. Uh, there, there is a lot of uh, there is a lot of uh, good people on Facebook. Uh, Tone did the, the Crypto Scam uh, broadcast, which where he analyzed every uh, scam calling it a scam, even if you don't agree, if you see, no, that's a legit project, but you should look at that because you can understand at least something a little bit uh, not completely sound in many, many projects. Uh, Bitcoin Uncensored was good, uh, maybe a little bit exaggerated uh, toward the end, but it was a good source of information for me. Of course, not very, if you are too sensitive, that's not for you, but uh, if, you can, if you can stand it, Bitcoin Uncensored was a very good show. Uh, that said, well, of course you have to follow me on Twitter, that's the best. Okay. I have so many questions. Mm. Ah, the, the one that I would like to ask you, uh, let's say your, your theory is that uh, Bitcoin transactions are expensive now. We should keep the block size lower so that we achieve censorship resistance. Uh, do you think that any of the top 100 altcoins are censored in any way? Because in my opinion, it's not very difficult to achieve censorship resistance right now. Would you comment on that? Uh, this is a good question. Uh, that, that's a good question because the actual answer is no. I, don't, I think that all the altcoins right now are censorship prone, so easy to censor. But I do not think they are censored because uh, it's not worth it. Uh, I think that uh, right now, Bitcoin is big enough to have some and used enough to have some attempts to censorship. Uh, let's give me, uh, let's give you some example. Um, let's assume that you use uh, ETH to buy not you but your cousin will use ETH uh, uh, to buy drugs on uh, on the on the dark markets of the dark web. So. Uh, that's become something uh, important, a huge market using ETH. And so the, the DEA will call uh, the Ethereum Foundation, asking them to blacklist with a soft fork all the addresses of uh, the, the, the reused address, because you know that in Ethereum, you, you reuse addresses because it's account-based and not UTXO-based. So they have to censor the black market. 
And now, Vitalik and friends at the foundation, they have to, 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 to maintain a serious phase, and they have to answer, uh, we can't. It's an independent protocol. We cannot support to censor a transaction for political reasons. And the DEA guy, well, you did it. Well, when they, they, they took the money from the DAO, the, the AO contract, you did censor that because uh, it was uh, uh, because you lost you lose your money, and uh, you have to maintain a straight face and tell them no, I can't. Now imagine with Bitcoin, if I am the DA, if I, there is Silk Road, uh, there were some senators that tried to to call Gavin Anderson, telling him you have to to change Bitcoin to to shut down the Silk Road, and he. Louted and everybody will have louted because I mean, who do you call? Uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, good luck. Uh, w w nobody changed Bitcoin for political reasons. When empty Gox was emptied, nobody asked for a, a, a reversal of, of the payments. When the DAO was act, it happened. And even, uh, even in other, uh, in many, many cryptocurrency created by one, I mean, Zcash is a, a super anonymous. Uh, coin. If Zcash was or will ever be really used in the black markets, uh, you have one company that is receiving directly in its wallet a certain percentage of every of every reward. So it's, it's a company directly maintaining and controlling the protocol. Every time uh, that, that's true, even for Monero in a way. But Monero has, but Monero at least has some uh, anonymous developers, which is good if they attack Fluffy Pony. Something else can take its place, uh, but many altcoins they have a centralized uh, company, maybe for-profit company managing the coin. That's w th that's the most censorship-prone thing you can have. So I don't think there are strongest. Uh, the the most strong example of censorship is the DAO uh, are short fork and then our fork, uh, and it was an internal censorship. Not an inter so what you did with my so code is, is low. Unless you take my money, then cut is not low anymore, and I want my money back. But except for that, which was an internal censorship, uh, I don't think that they are even trying to do something which probably the, yeah the ICO is another example. ICOs uh, are mostly uh, were mostly thought as uh, crypto securities, so illegal or illegal or paralegal kind of securities, which is good. I mean, uh, Bitcoin is an illegal or paralegal kind of payment. And ICOs were para securities, uh, which was illegal for SEC and everything else. So uh, the, the, the states started, the SEC started to ask, are you issuing an unregulated security? So you could go to jail. And uh, imagine this for Bitcoin. Are you really paying WikiLeaks? You can go to jail. Answer, I don't care. I am Bitcoin. <laughs> you cannot stop me. Uh, you are an ICO, you are a security, you will go to jail. Okay, no, we are not really a security, we are a utility token. We don't know why our value should go up, because we are just a utility token, so the value should stay, stay the same. But we are utility, we, you just use it for, for payment. Uh, we stopped being a, a, an equity, we stopped being uh, the, the, the real... I mean, everybody's promoting ICO as a security, actually. But they, they pretend it's not a security, except, of course, eternity, uh, which is the only case different. Uh, so the, the problem here is that uh, ICOs are an example of people so that know so well that they can, can very easily be censored that they don't even try to be censorship resistant. They adapt the narrative to order, in order to, to the, for the adversarial to not even try to hit. So I would say no, almost no altcoin is censored. Almost every altcoin is very, very easy to censor right now. So the, bit, the Bitcoin price, because I, ha I know that we have a lot of traders and investors here. We usually have them. Uh, so how do, you, how do you interpret the Bitcoin price? And this is the first question. The second question maybe should be the first question is how important is price, the price of Bitcoin for you? Very good, press, very good questions. So uh, about the price, uh, somebody in this room can tell you that I'm the worst trader ever, and that's probably true. I, I mean, uh, I, I, uh, in the long run, 
I behave like a good trader because I bought Bitcoin some years ago. I told all my friends to buy Bitcoin. It was right. Uh, so in the long run, I'm a good trader. In the short run, I'm not really super skilled about trading. And I probably missed every kind of uh, trading opportunity in the world. Uh, in my in BHB office, almost everybody made a lot of money with Ethereum, a lot of money with almost everything. And I just watched. Uh, but I had my Bitcoin. So I, overall, I am happy. Uh, in the short run, I'm not the best guy to give uh, advice on the price. So the price is uh, good. I think this underrepresents the demand that, that there is right now. And I uh, say this because we work with uh, institutional investors and banks, and they are working to enable institutional investors in order to, uh, to, to buy Bitcoin. This is a very huge pressure. When you go to a, a corporate or a financial or fund-based event, there, are, there is a lot of people asking you about investing in Bitcoin or in crypto. When you start to explain them about a wallet, about an exchange, then they just, uh, they just shake and they fade and they, they, they don't go over. So this, this demand is right now blocked by a very huge friction. It's okay for us to go to buy, but for a normal investor just to use to raise the phone and ask tree of gold, tree of oil, and tree of they, they will ne they, they are not getting Bitcoin. When they will, with an ETF or with Swiss banks or with Japanese banks, then when the average bank user will be an investor will be able to raise the phone and ask Bitcoin to their bank, uh, the demand will be very different from now. Uh, also. I think that right now the price is somehow discounting the hard fork, the yet another hard fork mess. So there are, there are serious uh, concerns about Bitcoin in general, and, and after they will resolve in a way or in the other, the price could go, down, could go up. Also, cool stuff like Mast, Lightning Network, Tumblebit, all the th stuff that w we want a SegWit for, now we have SegWit. And now we have to develop the interface, we have to get the user to use them, so it will take a lot. And when they actually see what Lightning Network means, even for the anonymity and the privacy of Bitcoin, um, right now people say is, eh, Bitcoin is all tracked, so uh, you, it's not really anonymous, it's anonymous because you can track forever. And I also say that to regulators to keep them quiet, but when they do understand Lightning Network, <laughs> that's game changing. Uh, so. Uh, Without this consideration, I will not dump my Bitcoin, and every month I buy Bitcoin. But I did that also when Bitcoin went down for two years. So uh, not really an advice. Uh, how much is important? People like to say that it's not important. Uh, it is, in my opinion. It's not very important for Bitcoin itself. Bitcoin can grow, can become more robust if the price is low. Uh, it, it will just take longer maybe to develop, but it's okay. And maybe it's even better for Bitcoin because uh, it will g grow organically. Uh, you remember when Satoshi asked to, to WikiLeaks, please do not accept Bitcoin because we are not ready to this exposure. We have to stay little, to stay slow. So as a low price, slow, a slowing, growing price would be better for Bitcoin, but not better for me because the only kind of, I mean, uh, we get, euro for our work, but basically my personal uh, income uh, is all invested in Bitcoin. So I do think the price is important to me. Okay, thank you very much then. And if there are no more questions, I can close this meetup. I hope you guys liked it. I uh, liked it and I can see you on Thursday and next week on Wednesday. Have a great night. <laughs> hey, bye everybody.